HS Religion Pillar institutes a family chapel. And the English department prepares in the junior research paper. Hello and welcome to KEHS. I'm Quan Marion. And I'm Olivia Henshaw. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Night Vision News. Recently, EHS students, along with their advisories, have been digging deeper into chapel by answering questions during advisory time. It's called Family Chapel. Here to take us to this exciting time is KEHS reporter Jamie DeGeorge. In this segment, we interview students and teachers about how they like Family Chapel and how it's affected them. We interview teachers and students around campus and ask them how Family Chapel has affected their day-to-day -day lives. I like that it's a closer experience with your advisory and it's not just listening to the chapel. Um, we like about um, Family Chapel is that we get to learn more about each other and get to bond. Yeah, I think they engage more with it than they do with the videos because it's more interactive. Here is a freshman leader conducting Family Chapel. Hear our prayers, be our strong rock in times of trouble, strengthen us to do your will, and grant us your peace. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Um, I, I think what we enjoy the most is that at the point where the um, they ask, you know, is there anybody you'd like to pray for or think about, or it's a really beautiful sharing moment. Thank you for watching our news segment. I'm Jamie DeGeorge, and go Knights! Thank you, Jamie, on that wonderful insight on Family Chapel. This year, even through COVID, junior nights still have to do a junior research paper. Field reporter Lucas Dollarboy gives us an insight about how the juniors are handling their eight-page paper in the midst of a pandemic. Pandemic, juniors are still having to write their eight-page paper. I got some insight behind the scenes with Miss Adams on how the juniors are handling it. So I would say the main purpose is that we want to prepare our students at Episcopal for college because we're college preparatory school. Um, writing a paper of that length, so for the level students, it'll be eight full pages, I believe. Um, we're trying to build the endurance for you guys so that when you get to college and your average paper is, let's say, five to six pages or five to seven pa pages, you have the confidence and you know that you have the skills to do that. And then the same goes for the research component that we're teaching you how to do that. In addition to the interview, I was also able to get Dr. Burke teaching her class on how to write and compose their paper. That's why we start with the question. Once you've gathered all of your possible information, so let's say your question is, should we have to wear uniforms? You gather all the evidence and you come to the conclusion that based on the evidence, no, we should not be required to wear uniforms. All the juniors are reading the Kite Runner. Um, that's a first for us. So all of us are reading a shared text. We're gonna focus and individualize um, each of your essays on a critical lens. So that's where you all will have some more agency and creativity in choosing your topic. So the juniors just started their papers coming back from winter break and they'll submit the final product the day before spring break. It's a very exciting day. So it's a little different than in a normal English classroom where it's discussion based and we maybe give just two or three prompts. So we'll definitely carve in time to conference with each individual student and serve as a guide for them when they're crafting their thesis. I'm Lucas Dollarboy reporting for KEHS News, back to the studio. Wow, isn't it crazy that even through COVID-19, the EHS juniors represent our academic pillar strongly? Remote learning here at school has made it easier to follow the COVID safety precautions while still staying on campus. Reporter Megan Knight spoke with many students on their thoughts about the new virtual aspect of learning. Hi, I'm Megan Knight reporting for KEHS News. As you know, remote learning has become a big part of daily life here at Episcopal. Remote learning is, has been introduced to reduce the risk of COVID and help everyone spread out. So we asked people what, they, what their thoughts were on remote learning. Uh, I like remote learning because it's relaxing whenever we have them on Wednesdays and it's a lot safer than being in school. And uh, I like how you get to um, have more time throughout the day because it's a shorter period, of, or it's a shorter day and you can catch up on your homework and stuff and it's comfortable to be in your own home and you don't have to wear a uniform. Online learning, uh, it's a very safe and effective option for schooling for me at least. Uh, coming from a family with like underlying health issues, it provides me a way to get the education I need and uh, just stay safe at the same time during times like this. Uh, the Wednesdays we have off uh, just provides, just gives us a good day to relax and just 
get away from the school environment. And then uh, the remote learning they offer at school and the, and the, and the gyms uh, just offers a, and again, a safe and effective way to get schooling and education. Remote learning has been very beneficial in keeping our daily lives as close to normal as possible. I'm Megan Knight reporting for KEHS News. Thanks for the report, Megan. I'm glad there's a better way to ingest an in-person school. Last semester, EHS presented their winter play, Letters to Sala. Our own field reporter, Abigail Klinkerman, gained some insight on their production process and got some one-on-ones with members of the show. The EHS theater program has had a stellar season, with the winter play being the highlight of the fall semester. Based on a true story, Letters to Sala tells the life of Sala Gertner, a prisoner of the Nazi labor camps. In present day, she tells her family about the experience through a series of letters she kept during her time in the camps. While the subject matter is sensitive, we talked to the director, Mr. Ravaz, about how he approached the project. I actually read, I first read Letters to Sala about three years ago, and I've been looking for the right spot to put it in. I didn't really know where we'd be politically, nor was I worried about that when we, it, the way it worked out was very interesting with everything happening in the world. But I just thought it was a great story and very well told. Um, and so I was interested in doing it whenever we could. What was challenging about Letters to Sala primarily was that, uh, especially when we started filming right toward the end, we had some people go out on quarantine and we found that we just really needed to stay flexible. Will McKinney, a senior cast member, offers his insight on his experience this past semester compared to others. To years past, it was very different. It was obviously a lot lack of uh, just bonding, obviously, but other than that, it, things were generally the same vibe. Everyone knew what they wanted to do, but yeah, it was still a fun process and I enjoyed every part of it. As you can see, EHS On Stage has tackled all the challenges presented by COVID-19 head on. And they've done a pretty spectacular job, if I do say so myself. Reporting for KEHS, this is Abigail Klinkerman. Thanks, Abigail, for the behind the scenes scoop. Computer music is one of the new interesting arts electives at EHS. Let's join KEHS reporter Chase Jenkins in the band hall as he looks into this intriguing arts offering. Here at the band hall, where the magic happens, where students can gain a new aspect of music, we asked Mr. Gould a couple questions on what you can gain and students on what they um, learn from this class. Operating under the arts and often in conjunction with the religious pillar, the music department strives to provide a meaningful experience for music students and the EHS community at large. Through study, practice, and performance, the music department provides students with opportunity for self-expression and a way to experience something greater than oneself through encounters with great music in both chapels and classroom settings. So computer music is a kind of a newer class that we have at Episcopal High School where Basically, uh, the kids would call it, you get to learn to make beats, but it's so much more than that. It's where you get to take your creative ideas and basically use a computer to get the music out of your head into the real world. We learn all kinds of things like how to make trap beats, how to make house beats, trance beats, your favorite genre, rock and roll, recording, how to do uh, video, or not video, audio editing, and all kinds of things that basically, skills you can use in the real world, especially if you're interested in production and anything like that. So any student who chooses to enroll in computer music can get quite a bit out of the class. They can basically learn some things about music even if they've never had a music class in their life. They can learn some things about technology that they may never have learned about in terms of sound and how it relates to the art of music in general. They can learn how to use synthesizers, they can learn about things about drums, they can learn things about instruments that they may never be able to play but they can certainly learn to manipulate it and basically uh, harness maybe a form of creativity that they didn't even know they had. Any kid who takes the class comes away much more knowledgeable about music in general, about uh, many of the popular genres of music that we listen to on a daily basis. And at the end of the day, they just come out probably a more creative and fulfilled individual. Yeah, so I chose computer music class because I've always been very into instruments from a young age. I started playing guitar when I was about six and I took classes in middle school. And I, I always have really enjoyed music. I tried taking up learning the piano and bass and other instruments. It's always been something I liked and computer music is kind of like the next rendition of that. There's like more possibilities, more stuff you can do with it. There's more future for it, especially since we're moving towards more like technologically advanced equipment and everything. And one thing I hope to gain is having a better understanding of all of it. And hopefully I'll be able to synthesize my own instruments and have, be able to do a lot more than I can already do, take it to the next step. 
That looks fun, Chase. Thanks for the report. Nights you want to make consider signing up for the computer music registration just around the corner. The success in Episcopal baseball program has been clear over the years and how much talent has carried over the Rice baseball program. Today reporter Luke Braga breaks down how former EHS alumni Blake Fox and Antonio Cruz has helped the Rice baseball program and what it means to EHS. Hello, Luke Braga here with my dad, Matt Braga, head baseball coach at Rice University. Today I'm going to ask him some questions about former Episcopal baseball players who have gone on to play college baseball at Rice. The first thing I asked him was to tell me about some of the recent guys that have come through Episcopal and then have gone on to play college baseball at Rice. Here is his response. Well, right now, Luke, we currently have Antonio Cruz in our program, who played at Episcopal three years ago. Um, his brother, Trey Cruz, also ran through Rice University, previously at Episcopal High School, drafted in the second round last year by the Detroit Tigers. And before them, and before my time at Rice, Blake Fox, one of the assistant baseball coaches at Episcopal, um, also was a pitcher for our Rice University baseball program. My next question is, why do you think these guys from Episcopal have been able to go to Rice and succeed at such a high level? Well, number one, first and foremost, they're very talented. They, they have great baseball ability. Number two, they are hardworking young men. Like, they understand what it takes to play at the highest level of college baseball. And the last question I asked was, are there any commonalities that you can pinpoint among Episcopal baseball graduates? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing I can tell from Antonio and Trey and just knowing Blake Fox, the system that is run at Episcopal is a good baseball system. It's a good baseball program. So they're taught well by the head coach and all the coaches. They do a good job teaching these young men how to play baseball, how to do things right, not only on the field, but off the field. This is Luke Braga reporting for KEHS News. The baseball alumni here have made a clear impact on the field after high school, no doubt about that. In light of recent events in this country, we can truly appreciate the people who serve or have served in the military and put their lives on the line for us. One of those is Mr. Andrew Lauer, EHS history teacher. KEHS wanted to examine the miraculous and interesting time he had while he was in the Army. Here's reporter Zach Lewin with a look at this brave American. So, Mr. Lauer was in college in England, and he noticed that college was very pricey, and he didn't know how he was going to pay for college. So, he eventually found out about how military pays college for free, and how he even earns money. He, this, was ha this happened due to the GI Bill, which was passed by Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1944, where military personnel can go to college for free after they serve and also get paid. So Mr. Lauren Toll spent five years in the military. He first started off with three months in Georgia at Fort Benning. Then he went to two years in North Carolina at Fort Bragg. Then two years in Kentucky at Fort Campbell. And then he spent his last nine months in Afghanistan. My job was basically demolitions. Once in a while I got to blow stuff up and that was kind of fun. <laughs> As a Green Beret, our primary job is ultimately teaching. I mean, um, Afghanistan was amazing. Just some of the most beautiful views that you could imagine. Afghanistan's really an incredible country. There's not really much, you know, industry, so there's not really much pollution. The skies are just insanely blue. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen cleaner skies. You know, I don't think getting shot at occasionally kind of put a damper on it. I found myself in my life dangling from a rope that I was harnessed to that was on the bottom side of a Black Hawk helicopter as we were flying over a national forest in North Carolina. I gotta say that was cool. I had to be I accountable never... for all sorts of, of equipment that was James Bond gadget type stuff. People are a little bit softer, you know, when they're, when they're not in the military. The military hardens you a little bit. Driving. I didn't like it when people tailgated me. And I didn't like having someone, I didn't like being stuck in traffic because generally speaking, you usually got hit when you were congested and slowed down. Every day it was tough and it was challenging and there were days that sucked in a way that you hopefully can never imagine. I'd give it an eight out of 10, honestly. I, I'd still do it. 
Mr. Lauer didn't gain just the money from the military. He gained patience, self-defense, courage, respect, maturity, accountability, and even lots of more important things that he learned he, that he uses today. Thanks, Zachary, for that educational and interesting report about the pros and cons of being in the military. Again, thank you for keeping America safe and for your service, Mr. Lauer. Well, that's all we have this week on Night Vision News. I'm Quan Marion. And I'm Olivia Henshaw. From all of us at KHS News, thank you for joining us. And, and go, go Knights! Knights.